so Matteo is uh, here as a postdoc on a Welcome Fellowship, a very prestigious Welcome Fellowship from uh, the UK. He's been doing quite a lot of work with Mara Cerciani that uh, many of you know uh, on multimodal imaging, and in particular doing uh, G-ratio connectomics. Uh, so he's going to be doing quite a lot of that together with Tommy in the lab. But then today he'll also tell us about other things that uh, he's interested in. And obviously he likes puns, so I'll let him, I'll let him explain his uh, Star Wars uh, reference. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, um, I entitled this talk, uh, Rock Matter as a Sparse Wars Story. Uh, actually, Sparse Wars, I, I did not invent this expression, unfortunately. It's uh, an actual expression in the title of a paper by Alessandro Daducci's group on uh, the use of uh, spherical deconvolution for uh, tractography. And uh, I entitled this way because it will be mostly on uh, white matter. Oh. Oh. Okay. And, uh, however, I actually started uh, quite far from uh, neuroimaging. I started with uh, signal processing, and at some point I found myself working with uh, fMRI. And when I started my PhD, uh, it was um, I, I could I had the chance to pick my own topic, and I picked uh, uh, connectivity without knowing uh, uh, what uh, specifically it was. It was uh, in the time where uh, from we were switching from uh, the idea of uh, connectivity to the idea of uh, connectom. This is still something that uh, I'm in uh, a love-hate uh, relationship. And uh, basically, just to filling up who is not uh, much familiar with that. Uh, basically, we get a T1 weighted image, we parcel it, and then we decide if we want to do functional connectivity, we will need the uh, fMRI. So we will calculate the correlation between uh, the both signals in uh, each pair of, uh, of regions from the parcellation. Or if we want to do something structural, we would need tractography. So we will count <coughs> the streamlines between uh, each pair of regions. And basically, we are trying to transform uh, uh, an image into a different mathematical object that is a graph. Uh, I want to stress this. So we are trying to model the brain as a network using the graph as a mathematical formalism. And uh, this is how it looks like in terms of mass. And when we put it on a brain, it just looks like this. Basically, we are looking at uh, how many connections as a region, at the paths between different regions, and we are trying to find uh, uh, useful metrics for uh, characterizing the brain, characterizing the brain in pathology. And this is basically what I started doing when I was working in Rome at uh, the Neuroimaging Lab in, uh, at um, Santa Lucia Foundation. Uh, I started working on uh, some data from uh, uh, myotonic dystrophy patients where we were able to find uh, differences in terms of uh, centrality measures and in terms of uh, uh, subnetworks. This is uh, functional connectivity. Uh, we also work with um, Alzheimer disease patients and we were able to characterize uh, um, patients and subjects with uh, lower or higher uh, co cognitive reserve. And finally, we had the project where um, uh, we were using uh, a, a behavioral experiment where the patients uh, would go to a behavioral training and we were seeing if we were able to discriminate the pre and post. I'm uh, very brief about these ones because they were uh, mainly collaborations and it was still at the time where uh, I was just uh, trying things out. And uh, it was mainly trying to see which measures were able to differentiate either uh, population, uh, patient population groups and the uh, effects of possible treatments. And then after a while working on this thing, I decided uh, what uh, would be my actual uh, uh, personal project and what my dissertation in the end was about. Uh, it was about using uh, network models and graph theory to characterize non-invasive brain stimulation. The interesting thing is that uh, um, the, the boom of uh, the connectomics uh, has coincided with the, the time where the paradigm shift from uh, um, looking at the specific re regions in the brain um, was central to the new approach where the importance was on distributed activities and how 
the regions were interrelated uh, to each other. And in this way, um, non invasive brain stimulation was uh, an invaluable is was and is an invaluable tool because it allows to actually modulate uh, in vivo what uh, what is happening in the brain. So um, I started first working on uh, transcranial direct current stimulation with the EEG. So it's uh, uh, basically applying uh, a current a direct current on the scalp between uh, two given electrodes, and uh, there has there have been a lot of applications of this and. Uh, it has been uh, a lot of popularity, uh, some controversy, because uh, there has been shown that not always the um, actual the brain is receiving enough, uh, enough current. Uh, what we were trying to see here was to characterize how um, the EEG registered concurrently with TDCS could cause uh, um, special effects outside the area between the two electrodes. And uh, here uh, there are the beautiful connectivity matrices. Of course, when you look at connectivity matrices, they don't ever make sense. You start to try to see, ah, they look more colored here rather than there, but of course it's, uh, it's not useful. And uh, uh, we started looking at the differences using uh, um, anodal and cathodal simulation, so depending on which uh, of the stimulation electrodes was positive and was negative. And we actually saw that we were uh, looking at uh, um, effects that were uh, actually distributed outside the area between the, the two electrodes that were stimulating. And we, would also, we were also able to uh, identify, that here the resolution is not the best, in uh, the electrode C4 in the theta band in the cathode that there was um, a significant increment in terms of number of uh, functional uh, connections. Then I went back to fMRI, something that I will never go uh, do again, and uh, I was involved in a project where we were trying to use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation on the posterior parietal network. Uh, now, TMS is uh, very useful and it's very straightforward when it comes to the motor cortex because you stimulate and you see the effect so you can tell that you stimulate and what is the what the effect is when it comes to any area outside the motor cortex it's kind of complicated to understand what is happening here uh, this experiment took place after a behavioral one where um, some healthy subjects showed to have uh, some um, uh, increasing in memory performances uh, after uh, the stimulation. So we repeated the experiments uh, uh, doing uh, pre-post fMRI and the follow-up will, will go in uh, two different time points. So we would have a first uh, follow-up and then after one minute, a second follow-up. And actually, uh, in uh, this case, I looked at modularity, so how the uh, brain regions are organized in uh, functional, uh, functional communities. And in terms of uh, the modularity score and in the, the number of modules, uh, we didn't see anything uh, significant either in the sham or in the effective stimulation. However, when we looked at something completely different that is called the uh, um, uh, Wimera uh, cartography approach, where basically you are plotting uh, um, each node that is each brain area in terms of uh, how they interact in their own community and how they interact through the uh, different communities, that is the former within module degree and the, the latter participation coefficient, we saw um, an, a significant effect in the left temporal pole, so actually quite a far region from uh, the precunius that uh, we were uh, stimulating. This was uh, um, corrected for uh, multiple comparisons, of, of course. And then uh, when we actually looked at the number of nodes uh, in, um, in the precunius uh, community, we could see that uh, uh, there was a significant increase in the second time point, not the first one as the effect on the left temporal pole. So we started to think, to think, so the effect here seems that as soon as you stimulate, this is an inhibitory stimulation, you are uh, um, disrupting the, connect the functional connections with uh, uh, the temporal area, and then as a later effect, you see an increment of the number of functional connections of the precunius. The latter part seems straightforward and seems to, um, to 
to corroborate the, the, thing, the observation we had in the behavioral uh, uh, experiment. The first part it sounds kind of strange. Yeah. Sorry, is it good to compare the dirty people? Sorry? Those uh, individuals, are there, are they healthy uh, subjects? Elderly, cognitively no, like impaired? No, 30, like 30 years old uh, of see. average. Adults. Yeah. Okay. And do you know that they have uh, uh, memory problems? Like, uh, no, no, completely impaired? healthy. And uh, so the left temporal pole was quite curious, but actually this was the same thing that we could find using just a seed-based uh, analysis in uh, the actual precuneals. And uh, after this, we decided uh, that um, there has been a bigger project on this, uh, and we looked at the, what the effects would be with uh, a more uh, um, intensive treatment on uh, MCI and MCI population. So here we they had um, for two weeks uh, um, a real uh, TMS session each day, then a period of uh, washout of two weeks, and then two weeks with a sham or vice versa. It was a uh, uh, double blinded uh, design. How do you make uh, sham TMS, by the way? Like, sorry? How do you make sham TMS? Ah, so uh, basically the person that uh, is um, receiving TMS, if it's someone that is, uh, has been already with, with the TMS, uh, will notice because basically you simulate uh, the, the click of uh, the, the stimulation, but then uh, the call is not emitting anything. So if you can't, like, if somebody's done TMS, will they know that it's a sham? Yes. Okay, so it has to be a naive. Yes. Yeah, and I've got it, and it's a pretty good recipe. If they change the intensity, you will tell that at least one of them is like the real experiment, and that's uh, yeah. they're giving the in fact, just an anecdote, the first time I went through a TMS experience, actually the, the first one, the first time I didn't know if I, it was a sham or a stimulation, and then I went to the person and I told her, I told her actually, it, it wasn't that bad. And uh, she told me, well, uh, actually, this was the, the sham session. Does that mean it was that bad or it was actually? It wasn't bad, but I could feel it. Yeah. So um, what you observed here is that uh, actually after the the real session, we observed uh, an effective uh, um, increase in the, in the memory test. And using a concurrent TMS EEG, we could see that uh, we would have in real TMS uh, an effect in terms of uh, an activation in uh, the frontal area, even when we were stimulating on the parietal cortex. And when we looked at uh, fMRI, we found that there was a significant uh, um, subnetwork that was uh, increasing, increasingly more connected uh, after the real stimulation rather in uh, the sham case. And uh, here, since the, we had just uh, five sub, so this was with 14 subjects, unfortunately we were able to recruit just five subjects for uh, the, the fMRI part. So you can see that uh, in, um, in the left part, it seems to be only on one side. In this kind of test, if you lower your threshold, you could see that something on the other side is uh, coming out. So it, it, it's one of those cases where uh, you, you don't know if you are seeing something that is lateralized just because you have um, a very small uh, um, subset of, of patients. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I started thinking about uh, the, all of the network model fantasies and uh, the, um, the approaches that I was using. And uh, I think that the fact, uh, the fact that uh, network modeling has uh, become so popular in so many, in so many fields, it's kind of uh, a curse for both us and other fields. Because, uh, of course, uh, it makes sense any time you think that the interactions in uh, a system made of uh, different entities make sense. But it starts to become hard to, um, to explain if a measure is, uh, makes sense or not. And uh, if it makes sense in a field, uh, if it does make, make sense also in another field. And uh, actually, in the brain, we have... Uh, quite a, a bad history of analogies since uh, the brain first was seen as uh, a group of meals. That's clearly not the case. 
Then there's a group of pipes with the, the pineal gland as the, the center. That's not the case. And now we are saying that the brain is like a social network. And I hope that as soon as possible, we reach the conclusion that uh, it's, uh, it's not the same. The results of the brain is like the computer. So that's <laughs> another one that's very popular. I'm a bit more disturbed from by the one that is like a social network. And uh, that when we have like epilepsy, it's like a sort of a Russian hackers uh, attack. Uh, this is a, a quote that I really like to, to point out every time I talk about this. Uh, this is from a, a professor from Cornell University that actually is not that well known, but uh, his experiments uh, with the graph theory network models were uh, very focused on trying not to use uh, any of the measures that are borrowed from uh, from other uh, fields, not because borrowing is wrong, but just because uh, it needs to make sense. And uh, after that, I moved to my postdoc at the UCL. And uh, I wanted to try something different. So I was uh, a lot interested on how, how white matter was organized. So I decided to keep on the track, but uh, abandoning, uh, at least for that moment, the, the field of uh, connectomics. And uh, when I started uh, working with the tractography for uh, surgical planning, I actually realized that uh, for uh, most clinicians, and especially for surgeons, the tractography that we all have in mind, actually, for them, this, this one does not make sense. For them, the one that makes sense is uh, something more like this, where uh, you discriminate the different bundles, because then, uh, with, with uh, their anatomy knowledge, they are able to, uh, to infer what they are doing if they are cutting through a bundle uh, or uh, if they are resecting. And uh, what we wanted uh, to do in this project was to build an automated pipeline to actually automate it, automatically reconstruct this bundle. Um, there are several uh, ways to do it, of course. Uh, we came up from, uh, with another one because we wanted something that was uh, quite simple. In this case, we are just using a list of uh, inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria dictated from anatomy. And, um, we actually went uh, through this uh, with the validation uh, asking uh, um, external raters to rate the actual uh, tracks we were reconstructing. This is how they looked like. And uh, this is a, a game that I played for a while with the colleagues and even uh, at SMRM to try to understand if they were able to tell uh, which, uh, which bundles were uh, segmented by humans and which bundles were segmented by an automated pipeline. If uh, you want to guess, uh, try to guess uh, which one, two of these are humans, one of these is the pipeline. Think of your guess because I'm about to show the results. And I'm going. And most of the time, people will always get wrong. Uh, and I was quite curious about this because uh, the, the actual uh, people that segmented these bundles were people that uh, were very familiar with segmenting these bundles. And one of these two actually did this for uh, surgical planning. And then um, when we actually looked at uh, the overlap uh, between, uh, at the agreement between uh, the human raters and the automated pipelines, we found that, that actually in most cases, the humans uh, were uh, disagreeing. That wasn't uh, actually a good news. And we also found out that uh, using, uh, here we were focused on language bundles. We also found out that uh, actually our uh, bundles were uh, quite convincing in terms of uh, overlapping with uh, what we were uh, observing from uh, language task fMRI. And this part is uh, the, actual, uh, um, uh, the actual scores uh, from, uh, from the raters. It's quite a complicated uh, uh, graph to explain uh, like this. It's better probably to, to read the paper. But the thing is that if you look at it, uh, you don't uh, see a lot of uh, clear differences between uh, the automated and uh, the, the human experts. And when we did uh, an actual uh, statistical analysis, we found out that uh, the one of the human raters and uh, the automated pipeline were uh, actually better than the other human. We weren't able uh, for statistical reasons to compare directly the automated uh, uh, and uh, the other human. 
and this is the point where uh, for a turn of events uh, I had the chance of uh, changing project in uh, my postdoc uh, so um, the, the, tractography, the, the tractography pipeline was done, the paper was submitted and the, the code was in, um, in, the, in the actual uh, Python package and uh, I decided that I want to go even more multimodally than uh, I went before and uh, I started working on a project that was trying to put together uh, histology and MRI. Now, when it comes to the human brain, you have uh, a lot of issues with histology. The first one, but it's not the, the most uh, troubling one, is the fact that, of course, you have a different contrast and a different uh, resolution between uh, the two modalities. And I will go through the other problems in a bit. But for uh, this first part, uh, one thing that I experimented with was um, trying to use uh, image synthesis to do to reduce the nonlinear registration problem to an actual intramodality uh, registration problem that would be easier. And uh, to actually do this synthesis, uh, I relied on uh, generative adversarial networks uh, from deep learning, of course. And uh, this specific archi architecture that I, uh, that I used was uh, the cycle gun architecture, where basically you have uh, two <coughs> generators and two discriminators uh, that uh, they are interconnected with each other. And in the end, you are uh, able to do these uh, very fancy examples where we see the zebras that become horses, the oranges that become headphones. And the issue is that, of course, you need a lot of data to, to do that. And uh, that's not something that uh, we have uh, in MRI, right? So um, an architecture that uh, Young Kai Huo from Vanderbilt University proposed was actually to extend the cycle gun with um, segmentation network so you would uh, segment uh, the you would transform uh, either the MRI, in this case was a uh, CT you would transform either the CT or the MRI in uh, the, the other modality and then you will segment it and then you will uh, compare the actual segmentation to see if they are uh, consistent this is actually a nice constraint and we extended this uh, adding another segmentation network so was a kind of a complicated architecture. And the thing here is that since we are not trying to predict uh, uh, unobserved things, but we are just trying to learn the mapping between one modality to the other, we actually don't need to have a training and a test set. And this is the big advantage because even when we overfit, it's not a problem. The problem is that if we are overfitting, we need to be sure that the mapping is actually the one that we expect. And here are, uh, are some of uh, the examples. You see the real MRI, and you see the synthetic histology, and uh, they actually looked uh, quite convincing. And then when we went and we did the registration, we had uh, a lot of um, manually placed landmarks on both the MRI and, uh, and the histology, and we saw that uh, we were starting to get better. These are the results that I presented at ISMRM uh, uh, this year. And uh, after this, actually, I kept uh, tweaking the neural net and I, I was able actually to reach even uh, better uh, uh, registration errors. And now the other problem is blocks because uh, one thing that I didn't mention here is the fact that if you want to slice a human brain, either you have one of those uh, few microtones that they use for uh, the big brain project or for uh, the Allen project, or you need to, to cut in blocks uh, each slice. It's a problem because then you will need to recompose this uh, three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And actually, it can be solved uh, if uh, you are starting to think on how you cut the brain, because since you are cutting first in slice and then in blocks, you need to start to model in the fact that uh, you are assumed that your blocks are uh, more or less uh, moving in slice. So what we did here is that we approach this as um, an optimization pro problem using a, a quasi-Newton uh, um, optimization algorithm, and uh, we would uh, you, we would use a loss function to model the fact that we wanted the blocks to overlap with the actual MRI slice, and we would 
um, allow in several iterations different kind of degree of freedom for uh, the potential transformation. For example, at the beginning we would allow the uh, region to move just in slice all in, in uh, different directions, then we would uh, move across slices and then we would introduce uh, uh, different scaling factors for each blocks. In the end, we built with this a uh, whole uh, processing pipeline and uh, we were able to go from uh, the actual uh, cut brain to something that looked uh, more or less like a brain. Here are the results. So uh, the moment where I finished with the, this project, the part that is still missing is the actual nonlinear registration with uh, the uh, block face uh, photo, the cut, uh, the cut photos that we are using as an intermediate modality. But uh, here, taking into account that there's no registration that has been done with the histology, you can see that you are able to navigate the MRI volume and actually retrieve something that uh, makes sense for what we are looking at uh, in, uh, in the MRI volume. And uh, there's a missing part in this story because in between my PhD and my postdoc, I found some time where I could work on uh, what I liked. And uh, I decided to explore something that I was very curious about that was uh, trying to put uh, a some myelination measures inside the, the, the connectivity approach and uh, that resulted in working on uh, the G ratio and try to see what the G, how the G ratio is different when used, when used as a weight in, uh, in connectons. Well actually is it quite different so uh, of course in this case it does not make sense to look at the, the the sum of the G ratio of, of the connections of each node as you would do with the number of streamlines, but it just look more sense to look at the average G ratio distribution of each of these. They are quite different from what uh, you obtain when you look at uh, the, 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 the number of connections distribution. And uh, we actually were able to distinguish between uh, the connections that were uh, connecting the more connected regions, the hubs of the brain, and uh, the other connections connected either a hub or a peripheral region or two peripheral regions. And uh, we were working on two different data sets that uh, were uh, acquired in uh, two different sites. So the fact that we were able to see uh, things that uh, were more or less consistent with each other was, uh, was a good news. And uh, after my postdoc at UCL, uh, with the experience that I gained, I decided to get back the, the myelin idea, but uh, try to understand really what we could tell about myelin. So more or less one year and a half ago, I started writing this project for a fellowship and I got it funded. And uh, I called my project Bamboo, mm -hmm. Building a Meaningful Biomarker of Myelin. And uh, the idea would be to try to understand uh, what we can, can actually say about myelin when we estimate from MRI and uh, what uh, they can, it can actually tell us about uh, the neurophysiology of the brain uh, in vivo. So this, uh, this project will be structured in three phases. The first one is uh, here uh, working on uh, animals and other things and, uh, as we will see in a bit. Uh, the second phase will be in Cardiff where we we will acquire data from uh, healthy subjects on uh, the connectom scanner and then the same subjects we will, we will go under uh, a TMS uh, uh, session where we where we, we where we will measure the the actual um, uh, conduction delays between uh, the um, the regions interconnected by the corpus callosum and finally Hopefully, with uh, better ideas of what is happening in the brain, we will go through the final phase in uh, Brighton at the University of Sussex in uh, multiple sclerosis patients. So far here in Montreal, we are thinking about uh, the RAT model. I'm uh, using uh, Aris uh, preliminary data to try to understand if uh, the actual RAT uh, is uh, a good model for, uh, for this particular experiment. And in the, the same time, uh, following um, a very good idea from Julian. We will acquire data from uh, uh, healthy subjects and uh, try to understand 
how much uh, the, um, the different ways that uh, we can estimate uh, uh, myelin uh, from uh, MRI are correlated with each other and how much uh, each of them correlate with itself in a subsequent uh, scan. And to conclude, I would just like to thank uh, all uh, the people that uh, supported me so far. And uh, of course, they were contrast for, uh, for funding me. And uh, I will be very happy to answer questions. All right, so thank you, Matteo. Uh, that was very comprehensive, a whirlwind tour. Uh, and I guess it touches on different projects in the lab. So I'd like to open it up for questions, comments, <clears throat> collaboration opportunities. So first about your fMRI studies. Yes. You said that uh, you assessed memory. Yes. Like, at least in two studies, there were like, an increase in memory performance. Yes. But you said that it's uh, normal adults without uh, memory. So they are um, impaired like, cognitively. The first one, yes. The second one was in uh, MCI patient. The second one is the one in the white image. It's the MCI. Yes, the, the one. Yeah. Image. And in both cases, you have an increase in memory. Yes. How do you, did you assess memory? It's uh, a cognitive test. Uh, I don't remember the details, uh, but uh, on, on the paper there are the details. Of of course, uh, you.